Hello again. I'm back with another drawing, and this one is a bit political. Are we drawing President Trump using pencils made in Mexico? Specifically, the Prismacolor Premier and Prismacolor Scholar pencils. I'll be doing a comparison of the Prismacolor student grade versus the artist grade pencils, and if you are only interested in that comparison, please skip to the five minute mark. I chose Mr. Trump as my topic for the drawing because of his somewhat surprising victory, and although I know his victory upsets a few people, about 50 million Americans and a few in Canada and Mexico, I hope to draw attention to some possible positive things that he might bring about. Keep in mind I'm skeptical of people who think human-influenced climate change is hogwash, and I don't have much faith in politicians in general. Plus, I watched about 30 minutes of the first presidential debate, and I find it hard to hold Mr. Trump in high standing. However, he's either more clever than people take him for, or he has put together a good team of people. First disclosure, I'm not an economist. But my discussion will be focusing on the economy. I'll be using the Prismacolor pencils as an example. At one point in time, the pencils were made in the US of A. They are probably one of the most popular pencils used by artists. Just over 10 years ago, they started making the pencils in Mexico. As a result, you've moved jobs from America to Mexico. A side effect is that the quality of the pencils decreased. Common complaints are poor quality wood and off-center leads, both resulting in an increase in broken leads. Other complaints cover blending differences. I've personally noticed inconsistencies in the wax used for both the Premier and the Scholar pencils. Now Mr. Trump targeted Mexico and China during his campaign, and he said he would rip up NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement. And he has a point. Up until the late 80s, U.S. growth was quite variable, with some nasty recessions, but also stronger growth during the up years. In the late 80s, manufacturing of goods started to move overseas, to countries where labor was cheaper. Often in these countries, environmental laws are weaker or non-existent, and they usually have poor human rights records. As manufacturing was moved offshore, the U.S. started to see more stable growth, but muted. This was coupled with the decrease in interest rates as the threat of inflation no longer remained. But there is a hidden inflation that isn't accounted for. This is quality. Things become cheaper to produce, so they could be sold cheaper. And often, but not always, there is a decrease in quality. That appears to be the case for the Prismacolor pencils. From my observations, moving manufacturing overseas hurts countries like Canada and the US in a number of ways. First, production of goods in countries where there are weak or no environmental laws damages both the local environment and the global environment as well. Loss of manufacturing jobs results in a loss of middle income jobs. In Canada, we have public sector jobs which generally have reasonable wages and good benefits. Then there are private sector resource manufacturing and service jobs. Take away the manufacturing and you're left with resource and services. Resource jobs are limited, as are the resources themselves. For service jobs, some pay well, most don't, but more importantly, some people just aren't designed to work in the service industry. So by moving manufacturing jobs overseas, you are forcing people into lower paying jobs and providing poorer service to customers. The whole concept behind the global economy and free trade is that by having open borders, you will create a level playing field and countries like China and Mexico will evolve to the point where they no longer have a cheap manpower advantage. This may be true, but there are two dangers here. First, you're going to do some serious damage to several generations of your own economy while you wait for the field to equalize. If my children grow up and decide to live in our hometown, there's a 90% certainty they will be employed in the service industry. Other alternatives are quite limited, but would include working for the local city or government, engineering work, or employment in healthcare. Now most of those service jobs pay at or near minimum wage. In order to purchase a home and raise a family, they need to work 100 hours a week at these low paying jobs. Second, and equally important, technology is evolving quickly. These manufacturing jobs we have sent overseas at some point will be mostly automated. 
Automation may level the playing field or bring the ball back into our possession. But with the factories already offshore, countries like China and India will have the advantage. And in the end, it will be their automation and control system engineers who will turn our economies into service and resource jobs. Our wage disparity will be set in stone as most people will cater to those with wealth, whether it's serving them coffee, cleaning or building their homes, walking their dogs, landscaping, and even taking care of their children. Now, whether Mr. Trump can change any of this is quite debatable. And even if he tries, he has his work cut out for him. Now for the pencil comparison. I've depicted President Trump as how he might be interpreted to his followers and his opponents. I should also mention, this is the first time I've really used my new 48 set of Prismacolor Premier pencils. This set I picked up for just over $30, so almost the same price as the Scholar pencils. I've used them for the left side of this drawing. I would like to note that the set has some great colors, but for whatever reason, there are no gray pencils. They include a silver and gold, but no gray. As most places carry singles, this can be easily remedied, but I do find it annoying that a set of 48 pencils contains no grays. Fortunately for this drawing, I didn't really need gray. I've used artistic license to modify some of the colors of the original image and made the suit and his eyes more blue than the original. I've also made his hair thicker and made him look a bit younger. For the Premier pencils, it is a love-hate relationship. The pencils blend amazingly, almost like a pastel. Even after blending or burnishing, you can still apply more layers because the wax is so soft. I find there are less problems with broken leads than the Scholar pencils, but the pencils are so soft you are always sharpening, and trying to get any detail is a struggle. My other annoyance is that little bits of lead crumble or break off, and then smear themselves somewhere else on my drawing. For the right hand side, I've used the Scholar pencils. This will be the last time I ever use them. The love-hate relationship with these has simply turned to hate. I spent nearly 10 minutes trying to sharpen the blue pencils for the jacket because they kept breaking. The set is new and it has only been used for one other drawing, my budget pencil comparison. One of the white pencils is also a write-off as it appears the lead has been shattered inside the wood casing. I've noticed inconsistencies in the softness of the leads. Some leads are as soft and creamy as the Premier leads. Others are hard and scratchy. I still think for a beginning artist, these pencils are great and they're easy to learn with. But when you compare this set at $20 to a 48 set of Premier or 48 set of Faber-Castell Classic pencils at around $30, I feel I am better off with the 48 sets to avoid the hassles of broken leads. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed the drawing. If you like the Premier or left side of the drawing, give the video a like. If you prefer the right side or the scholar depiction, hit the dislike button. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe. I try to add a drawing at least once a month.